We're here today to present to you Opening the Black Box by Ben Fowler and Chelsea Mizey. My name is Ben Fowler. Uh, I'm on the predictive analytics team uh, at Southeast Toyota Finance. And things that I really like to do are write Python, learn new things, and then in my spare time, be on the golf course. My name is Chelsea Mizey, and I'm a machine learning lead also at Southeast Toyota Finance. I have a background in statistics, having studied statistics in undergrad, and have a master's in analytics. Um, I work remotely, living in Denver, Colorado, and I like to spend my time skiing and mountain biking outside of work. So the intent of this presentation is to really talk about how can you as a data scientist or as a business user understand complex machine learning models. We're going to talk a little bit about techniques that you can use for uh, explaining them uh, using open source approaches. Uh, and we'll also then conclude with the demonstration of how you can visualize uh, model interpretability to business end users. So a quick walkthrough of the agenda. Um, first, we'll begin with the data, the description of the data set, including the sources, the source of our data and the features. Then we'll move on to feature engineering, which is the overview of the methods applied to columns to prepare for modeling. Um, next, we'll talk about feature selection, which is a discussion of the techniques used to select the optimal set of features. Um, moving on, we'll talk about our actual final model, um, including regular, regulatory compliance constraints and interpretation of the model. And then finally, we're going to talk about displaying the model. So we'll. Um, we'll have an example with Streamlit, a solution for model interpretation. So for consumer privacy reasons, we decided to use an open source data set found on Kaggle for this project, as opposed to using our internal SCTF data. Um, this data is called credit default risk. The target was a binary feature predicting payment difficulties. There were 346 features relating to credit bureau data, payment history, um, applicant assets, and a few external data inputs. One strength of this data is that it mimics real-world data with having about 1.2 million rows of data. Um, and then in terms of data exclusion, which I'll speak to more thoroughly later on, we excluded applicant features relating to gender, age, and family status. Okay, so feature engineering. After we cleaned the data and took time to understand the data um, through exploratory data analysis, the next step is feature engineering. To borrow a quote from Jason Brownlee, feature engineering is the process of transforming raw data into features that better represent the underlying problem to the predictive models, resulting in improved model accuracy on unseen data. So for this project, Ben and I performed four different types of feature engineering techniques including label encoding, where we convert labels into numeric sequences, one-hot encoding, where we create binary indicators for categorical inputs, mean target, target encoding, in which we replace values with the mean of the dependent feature, and then weights of evidence, in which we bend the feature and encode a value using the log odds of the good to the bad. Okay, so following feature engineering, an important part of the machine learning pipeline is figuring out which features need to end up in the final model. As a result of feature engineering, the data scientists may have hundreds, if not thousands of features in the data frame and figuring out the most parsimonious and predictive feature set takes a lot of work. Here, we tested out five different approaches. The first was an ensemble approach in which we created a weighted average of feature importance from six different algorithms to get the feature set down to 100 features and then use XGBoost and SHAP to find the optimal feature set. Next, we, we tested prediction value change, which is how much on average the prediction changes if the feature value changes, followed by loss function change, which is a difference between the metric or loss function obtained with the feature and without. Um, moving on, we tested permutation importance, where we measure the increase in the prediction error after permuting the feature's values. And then finally, SHAP, which is a game theory approach using local explanations. I wanted to quickly show you an example of how the feature selection process looks. Using MLflow, you can see here a scatter plot of model runs logged beginning with 100 features and using stepwise backward feature selection you can see how the model performance changes while eliminating one feature at a time. 
the key, or, the key here is to select the smallest or least amount of features and then the highest AUC. Here's a chart displaying the model statistics, AUC and F1, on each of the different feature selection tests we completed. In summary, we were able to find the optimal feature set using feature selection with ensemble approach and then use H2O's AutoML to find the optimal hyperparameters resulting in a final XGBoost model with target encoding. On this slide, I want to go into a little more detail on machine learning model interpretability. Machine learning models are extremely complex nonlinear models. In our work, we often use random forests and gradient boosted machines which means there can be hundreds of trees with many feature inter interactions, which increases the model complexity. When we talk about interpretation, we can say that traditional statistical models are able to give us global models or models that can tell us how something behaves in general. This makes sense because with regression, when we're talking, uh, sorry, we are taking a set of data points and fitting a straight linear line through that data to explain the trend. On the other hand, machine learning models give local behavior and are able to explain complex relationships in local areas of our data. With the interpretability methods we'll review next, we can harness the power of increased accuracy in machine learning while also being able to explain what's going on at an account level basis. I also couldn't mention machine learning interpretability without mentioning Patrick Hall. Go check out his GitHub repo to see a lot of great examples of machine learning interpretability. Continuing the um, discussion of interpretation, one of um, the te techniques that we all use here at SETF for machine learning interpretability is SHAP, which stands for Shapley Additive Explanations, and was created by Scott Lundberg. Using SHAP, you can explain the output from any machine learning model. Shapley plots originate from coalitional game theory and calculate the marginal contribution of each feature to an overall prediction. Before we go deeper into our model interpretation, I want to discuss with you um, how regulatory compliance impacts our models given we work for a finance company. To ensure that our model does not violate fair lending constraints, special attention must be given to protected features. For this project, we went through the entire model build process, including these protected features highlighted above to demonstrate the impact. This plot, uh, this SHAP plot sorts features by the sum of the SHAP value magnitude over all samples and uses SHAP values to show the distribution of the impact that each feature will have on the model output. The color represents the feature value with red being high and blue being low. You can see that there is distinct separation for both age and gender and how it relates to the target. For this reason, the features are not included in the final model. There could be a whole other presentation about how we make sure that our models don't negatively impact our customers after explicitly excluding these protected features, but that's a conversation for another day. So taking the, that shop, shop plot uh, example that Chelsea just showed previously, uh, shop plots can be great at allowing us to globally understand how important are our features in the model. Uh, on these two plots here, I'm showing the global uh, SHAP importance plots, uh, both on the validation and the test set. Uh, and you can see that generally these two plots are very similar. Uh, there are some slight deviations in uh, the order, such as like amount down payment uh, is below SK DPD default on the test set, where on the validation set, amount down payment is above. Uh, but generally, these uh, values track very similarly across these two data sets. So one of the things that I'd like to do when I'm looking at how do I want to model this data is actually try to identify, do I have any features that are very noisy, being that in one split of the data, uh, they behave in one way, but perhaps in another split of the data, uh, it looks very different. Uh, that's something that could be a red flag, because if you have a noisy feature, uh, it likely won't generalize well to unseen data in the future. Uh, secondly, next step that I would do with these plots is actually then uh, talk to business domain experts uh, to understand, do these features look reasonable? Uh, these XSource features, XSource 2 and XSource 3, uh, are features that we understand appear to be uh, related to credit scoring data uh, from our data set. Uh, and then next, uh, also you'll notice there's some features here with the underscore TE. 
And Chelsea talked a little bit about target encoding earlier, which is one of the feature engineering techniques that we did on our data set. Uh, and so an example of how that actually played out in this data set uh, is the occupation type TE feature. And on occupation type TE, we had different values for uh, uh, target encoded values uh, for the categorical values in this feature. So for instance, uh, there was a, a categorical value for occupation type of accounts, and then there was a categorical value of drivers in this feature. Uh, and drivers had a default rate at, right at about 11%, 11.1%, where accounts had a default rate of 3.6%. Uh, so by providing that information to the model of what the default rate is, uh, this feature engineering technique uh, is one of the most powerful feature engineering techniques you can do on categorical data. Uh, the target encoder that we used was the open source H2O target encoder, uh, which also provides advantages in allowing us to perform smoothing and adding random noise with cross-validation. Target encoding can easily overfit uh, if these types of approaches are not implemented. Uh, so by invoking uh, cross-validation with random noise and smoothing, uh, we can help our target encoded data uh, generalize better uh, to the future. And on this plot here, we can get an overview of features which are most important uh, for a model. Uh, we're plotting the shaft values of every feature for every sample. The plot sort features by the sum of shaft value magnitudes over all samples and use shaft values to show the distribution of the impacts each feature has on the model output. The color represents the feature value, with red being high and blue being low. The y-axis is sorted by global feature importance, so the most important features are at the top of the plot. Uh, I talked a little bit about target encoding uh, earlier on the prior slide. And, and so since target encoding is providing information with respect to the target feature, uh, we know that feature values that are high uh, shown in here as red. So like this organization type TE feature, those features that have red values are going to be features that have, or are going to be categorical values that have higher uh, default rates than uh, organization type categorical values that are in blue, uh, which would be lower default rates. This also allows us to understand that uh, the red valued uh, observations here uh, are providing a positive marginal contribution to a default prediction. Uh, and then also we can take a look here with this plot and understand the distribution of our data well too. So for instance here, if we take a look at occupation type and name education type, uh, two features that are very similar in global importance being right next to each other, uh, we can see that the occupation type TE feature uh, has most of the data just left of the 0, 0.0, uh, point on the axis of, uh, marginal contribution. So these, most of the data set is slightly, uh, providing a marginal contribution to a no default prediction. Conversely on the name education type TE feature, you can see a bubble here, just slightly to the right of 0, 0.0. So these observations are providing uh, a small marginal contribution towards a default prediction. Uh, the other aspect that's really great about this plot is you can get an understanding of outliers and how um, values uh, provide more contribution to a prediction, such as if we look at occupation type TE, the high target encoded values there have a, are further towards the right side of the x-axis on SHAP value than the high name education type TE values. Uh, so those features are more significant uh, in the contribution of uh, a default prediction than the high target encoded name education type features are. A dependence plot allows us to understand how a single feature affects the output of the model. The SHAP dependence plot shown here show that as XSource 2 and XSource 3 values increase, the SHAP values generally decrease, as you can see here going downwards. However, uh, we can also see a very interesting shape to the SHAP plot for the third most important feature, amount annuity X. And as you can see here, the amount annuity X feature shows that SHAP values can take a very nonlinear shape, where the maximum SHAP values on this feature are right at about 42,000. Uh, and uh, a feature value with a value above 42,000 or below 42,000 
is going to provide a marginal contribution that'll be less likely to default than a feature that would have uh, a value around 42,000. Interactions on these features with the most significant other feature are also represented on these plots in the vertical dispersion of the plot. So you can see here that these very high contribution features here on amount annuity X, if, you, if the amount goods price X is also high, that's providing an even greater lift towards a marginal contribution of a default prediction. Um, and then you can see other values here, such as uh, an extorse three, there's some values that have lower uh, chat values than other values here. And that's indicative of this interaction with this XSource one feature. So we've talked a lot about model interpretability. Uh, today, we'd like to then conclude our presentation with a demonstration of how you can uh, tie model interpretability with Streamlit. Uh, Streamlit is a user interface uh, that is very exciting. It uh, was introduced uh, at PyData Los Angeles last December. Uh, Streamlit apps are Python scripts run from top to bottom. Each time a user opens your app, the script is re-executed. Uh, as the script executes, Streamlit draws its output live in a browser. And there is a widget functionality that allows the user to provide uh, simulations. And you can do what-if modeling uh, with uh, Streamlit. So uh, as you can see here in this schematic here, basically the script is run, uh, data is stored to cache, and the app state is outputted and rendered in the browser. And then as the user engages with the app, uh, that new data then is stored to cache and a new state in the uh, app is rendered in a browser. So for this project here, we were really thinking it might be interesting to see how uh, can we represent uh, a model and how it changes in feature values uh, in uh, a form that a business user could engage with. And Streamlit provides the perfect solution. So we can do what-if simulations. And there's different types of uh, use cases for uh, what-if uh, simulations of a machine learning model. Myself or Chelsea, us as data scientists, we can use Streamlit to perform sensitivity analysis. So we can identify how our model will perform on a range of simulated values so that there will be no surprises when we bring the model to production. Uh, and this is an approach that Chelsea mentioned, Patrick Hall talked in the past about uh, many of his great interpretability techniques. Sensitivity analysis is just one of them. Uh, and here I've just kind of extended that sensitivity analysis and tied it in with Streamlit. Uh, if we want to talk about business users using Streamlit, uh, we could uh, talk about a use case where a finance company could have credit analysts uh, determine what levers could they use uh, when they're reviewing an application and identify if they can adjust uh, aspects of that application that could result in an application that would previously be denied to an approval state. Uh, and then thirdly, operations executives can use Streamlit to understand how changes in performance during key touch points in a customer experience could result in an impact to their likelihood to be retained, increased share of wallet, and word of mouth referrals that customers may provide uh, as uh, their aspect of their experience with the business uh, at key operational touch points uh, changes. So with that, we'd like to now actually move into a live demo of Streamlit. So what we're showing here is um, uh, an app that we built in Streamlit. It was very minimal code. Uh, we were able to implement this with under 150 lines of Python code. Uh, Streamlit provides the ability to uh, take user input. So here I've inputted an, imp an application, this application number of 262266 on the data set. Uh, and the first data frame is showing the prediction that is being rendered from the model, the probability of no default, and the probability of default. Uh, the threshold on this model uh, is right at 0.1315. So this, this prediction is rendering a default prediction, but it's not that far off from getting a no default prediction. Below that, we're then actually rendering in a data frame each of the features that were used in the model, the observation value that was for this row of data, and also the SHAP value. So negative SHAP values are uh, contributing to a no default prediction. And as I scroll down here on this data frame, you can see positive uh, values are contributing towards a default prediction. And then 
later on, we can actually then look at in a, a real nice plot, this is an Altair plot, how do those SHAP values appear plotted out, uh, where again, blue bars indicate features are contributing to no default prediction, uh, red bars uh, with higher SHAP values are contributing to a default prediction. And next, then we can perform sensitivity analysis uh, or what if analysis to actually see what happens if we were to change some of these values uh, in this row of data and how does that impact the prediction and the probabilities that are outputted from our machine learning model. So these five sliders here that I'm rendering, which happen to be the five most important features in the model, you can see again, this uh, observation is still showing a, a 0.17 probability of default. But as we were engaging with uh, this application, one of the things that we found that was very striking here is this fifth feature, XSource 1. If we move this value just down very slightly, just one level lower, the probability of default jumps from 0.17 to 0.22. And conversely, uh, as one of the use cases that I mentioned earlier was credit analysts may want to use uh, this to actually see how could I uh, get the applicant to uh, modify their application so that their application, uh, which was in a denial or a rejection state, could potentially change to an approval state. And one way that we could do this is with Streamlit, an analyst could actually manipulate some of these values. So let's say amount annuity X is the amount that the applicant is requesting uh, credit for. If we were to move this value lower and move this down to right at about 14,000, you'll see once I just get down to below 14,000, all of a sudden now this prediction has now changed to a no default prediction. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the uh, threshold was right at about 42,000 for maximum marginal contributions. So this was the feature that had that nonlinear uh, hump shape. And so if we move uh, this value higher, you'll start to see the probability of default decline. So if I move this to say like 60,000, that probability comes down to 0.211. And similarly, if we go under 42,000, that probability is also around 0.213. But as you can see, as we move that right up to about 42,000, it starts to spike a little bit. So that gives us also a very good understanding of how this model is behaving. Uh, other features that you could see here uh, are the other two very important features, XSource 2 and XSource 3. And as we manipulate these feature values too, you could see, okay, if this applicant, let's say these are credit features, if this applicant had better credit, which uh, is denoted by a lower value on this uh, this feature, the probability of default is, excuse me, uh, better credit is higher value, worse credit would be a lower value. So if we start moving this down to a lower value, you can see the probability default starts to spike significantly. And one of the great things about this uh, application here is all the values update dynamically in real time. So as I change these values, so let's say, if I look at XSource 3 and I move this value from 0.7463, and you can see currently XSource 3 is providing the most significant marginal contribution to a no default prediction. If I move this value to a lower value, which is going to contribute more towards a default prediction, this alter plot is going to update dynamically in real time. So let's say if I move that down to 0.4673, all of a sudden XSource uh, Three is it's still higher, but the bar is starting to come down. And then if I move it even further, now XSource three is now the fourth most important feature. And if I move this even further down, XSource three now will be changing colors from blue to red. And now it's contributing to a default prediction. And let's say if I was to move this even further down, let's say down around 0.10, it will be close to the most important feature. And if we move it all the way down, it will now be the most important feature contributing to a default prediction. Uh, so this really gives us a great deal of power in seeing how we can adjust um, features with sensitivity analysis and understanding their impact uh, through SHAP at the marginal contributions to uh, the prediction that is being outputted from the machine learning model. Uh, other couple examples I just want to show here is let's take an example of an applicant uh, that is very likely to not default. And if I 
enter an application number here, you can see this plot now showing mostly blue bars uh, where uh, the feature values are contributing to no default prediction. Uh, very few features are contributing to a default prediction. And you can see the probability default is 0 0.0036. Uh, one of the aspects of the way I built the sensitivity analysis in this plot is that the what if modeling here uh, is uh, being populated by the mean values in the data set. So you can see if the five most significant features for this observation had the mean value instead of the actual value, that probability of default increased from 0 0.0036 to 0 0.0897, uh, which is interesting. Still no default prediction, but it's higher. And then you can see here again, if I was to move a value, let's say XSource 2 to a much higher value, it's gonna bring that probability of default down and becomes the most significant feature of no default. If I make it a much lower value, it's going to then get a default prediction. And you can see XSource 2 will be the most significant feature towards a default prediction. Uh, and then lastly, I can show, let's take a look at an observation that is very likely to have a default prediction. Uh, this applicant had uh, out of the model a 72.3% probability of default being outputted from the model. And you can see that uh, very few features are providing marginal contribution towards no default. Most are providing a marginal contribution towards default. Uh, so uh, there's definitely, I think, a lot of uh, opportunity for uh, Streamlit uh, to really help us as data scientists uh, have a better and deeper understanding of our models, uh, but also interactively uh, demonstrate our models uh, to the business uh, as we work on our machine learning projects. And with that, that concludes my presentation.